Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Caitlin and this is my main channel where I upload all forms of true crime, psychology, education related content. I do also have a second channel where I upload beauty, fashion and lifestyle videos. So I'll leave that uh, in the description, but it is just Caitlin Rose Vlogs on YouTube. And I also just thought it'd be worth me mentioning since I have been gone a little while that if you don't already follow my Instagram and my TikTok, I am posting on there literally every day. So if you wanna see some more content from me, um, some more sort of day-to-day -day things of my life then check out both of those because I'm literally always posting on there but like I said I'll have all of that information in the description so you know where to look so today I'm back with another true crime case but this one is actually a solved one I don't think I've done a solved one in a little while and I do get like influxes of requests from you guys asking me to do these videos every now and then so I'm back with not only a solved case but it's actually a solved Jane Doe case that was solved last year I think it was uh, midway through 2020 after over three decades of it being unsolved so um an identity was found in this case the only thing that remains um, unknown to authorities is exactly what happened to the victim but we'll get into that later on in the video um, before I get started I just want to zoom through my usual disclaimer that I like to include at the start of all my videos just letting you guys know that I'm not claiming to be an expert in this case or any of the other cases that I cover over on my channel I'm simply relaying the information I maybe find myself through research on the internet and because only certain sources are accessible to me it means I may get things wrong leave things out or mispronounce things and I do apologize if I do any of those things I'm not trying to cause anyone any harm or an injustice. I'm just simply working with the information that I have available to me. Now with that out of the way, we should just go ahead and get started discussing the case of the Chesterfield County Jane Doe. The remains of the Chesterfield County Jane Doe were discovered on August the 7th in the year of 1986 in a landfill in Chesterfield in Virginia. The rubbish had been collected by workers at the School Street Transfer Station in Richmond, a stop that they had made earlier on in the day on their route. As they were unloading the rubbish they noticed something that had caught their eye something that would later turn out to be a set of human remains however it had not been a complete set of human remains the head had been removed the hand had appeared to have been removed by a saw and were missing and there were just a number of other pieces that weren't recovered so a thorough search by the investigators of this landfill site led them to only discover a leg a foot and a torso of this human a number of tests were carried out on the remains and authorities were able to determine that the remains had been that of a Caucasian woman placed at being between 22 and 32 years of age prior to her death. It was estimated that she stood somewhere between 5 foot 1 and 5 foot 5 inches tall. She weighed at being between 105 and 120 pounds and she was believed to have around size 7 feet. And the story around this woman's death remains a mystery for quite some years as there had been seemingly no information that could lead to an understanding of her past because of how little of her remains there had been discovered. In 2019, a company called the Paraben Nano Labs were enlisted to aid the authorities in attempting to reopen the cold case, with their speciality being in DNA technology, more specifically DNA phenotyping. So I tried to look up sort of a basic description of DNA phenotyping um, and one that I could find so it was according to newsmedical.net. DNA phenotyping is essentially the science behind predicting someone or something's physical or biochemical characteristics by using the genetic information provided by their DNA sequencing. And it's also a method that I believe can potentially lead to some potentially useful ancestry information based on this same genetic information. And as a result of these efforts, because of these sort of more modern developments in DNA technology, authorities were led to believe that the unidentified woman had either lived in or uh, frequented certain areas during her life. And these areas included the Richmond metropolitan area, Charlottesville, Buena Vista, Lynchburg, Baltimore or Maryland. And around this same time, the Chesterfield Jane Doe was entered into the Name Us database listed as an unidentified person. It was initially believed that the victim had died just a few days prior to being discovered in the landfill but the authorities were later informed that due to the condition of the remains that the victim was found in they were likely stored in a cool sealed environment prior to the discovery something like a refrigerator meaning that she may have died some months prior to discovery. It was suggested that this had been a way for the perpetrator to attempt to essentially go to significant 
significant lengths to be able to prevent anyone from discovering the victim's identity, as well as exactly how she died, since numerous parts of the remains were never discovered and the parts that were examined showed very little indication of who she was and how she died. But then, as a result of this cold case being reopened, in August of 2020, it was announced that the Chesterfield County Jane Doe was positively identified as Christy Lynn Floyd. Christy Lynn Floyd was 16 years old at the time of her disappearance and she'd grown up with her sister, a woman now named Kim Atkins, in a foster home in Lexington. When the pair were young teenagers, they decided to run away from their foster home and live with their biological mother, who lived in Richmond. According to Christy's sister, her and Christy were extremely close, especially since they had been just two years apart in age, with Christy being the younger of the two. And at the time of Christy's disappearance, the pair were living with their mother in West Gray Street in Richmond. The pair were known to have enjoyed spending their time at a dance club that was aimed at being for teenagers called The Cellar Door. It was a well-known and popular spot in the area for the local teenagers, although now the club no longer exists and it was, I think it was replaced by another music venue. Christy had begun working in a local restaurant just located just a few streets away from this club and this, and this restaurant is where the case of her disappearance begins. In June of 1986, 16-year-old Christy was at work late in the evening and she'd reportedly met up with an 18 year old boy. She had allegedly made plans with this young boy for them to run away together, but their plans then soon changed when Christy's mother had learned of their intentions. She decided to ring the parents of this 18 year old and threaten to go to the authorities and pursue statutory rape charges against the boy if her daughter wasn't returned home to her immediately. And upon hearing of this threat, Christy returned back to her mother's home the following morning. According to Christy's sister, the pair had spent a long time discussing the whole ordeal following her return home before Kim then decided that she would leave the house to go get herself some food. And when Kim then returned home, she found her mother asleep on the sofa in the living room and both the back door to the home and the alley door were wide open. And from this point on, there was no sign of 16 year old Christy. A missing persons report was filed, but according to the family, their claim just hadn't really been taken very seriously by the authorities allegedly because of the previous runaway incident that had occurred in the days leading up to that moment and it, it seemed as though they had sort of assumed that she would just turn up one day. And sadly, there remained no sign of Christy until the formal identification of her remains just last year. As with all the Jane and John Doe cases that I cover, it, it genuinely breaks my heart that all of these people can go unidentified for so long. But thankfully, because of the more recent developments in DNA technology, Christy's family were able to receive some final answers for her disappearance appearance over three decades later. So that is where I'm going to end today's video. It's a short case as it usually is with solved cases, but I hope you found this interesting nonetheless. Let me know if you do have any requests, like any specific cases you want me to research or any psychological topics. Always leave them down below or you can DM them to me and I'll add them to my research list. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you found this interesting and I'll see you guys very soon for another video. Thanks for watching. Bye.